Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We're studying a series of lessons entitled On Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. It's a series of lessons talking about what happens to people after they die, obviously. And this is a very serious lesson. It's lesson number 10 in that series for December 3 of 2022, entitled The Fires of Hell. Hmm, wow. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. <laughs> Father, we have come with an earnest desire to see the truth as presented in Scripture. We know that many people have twisted and changed and misinterpreted passages of Scripture to suggest some very horrific things. Help us not to make that mistake, but to try to see clearly through to what you want us to know is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does Dante's poem, The Divine Comedy, agree with biblical theology? Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, Italian poet Dante Alighieri, that in 1265 to 1321 AD, wrote his famous work, The Divine Comedy, about a fictional journey of the soul after death. The soul went either to the inferno, quote, quotes hell, or paragraph, in parentheses, hell, within the earth, or to a purgatory where the human spirit can purge itself and become worthy of ascending to heaven, or to paradise, to the presence of God himself. Though only a poem, fiction, Dante's words ended up having a great deal of influence on Christian theology, especially Roman Catholic theology. The basic notion of a of an immortal soul going to either hell or to purgatory or to paradise is foundational to that church. Let me interrupt for a moment. Do you think the church was believing those kinds of things before he wrote this? Or did they, did this just help to sort of make it more popular for people to believe these kinds of things? I mean, look at his, he, he, lived, he lived in the 13th century. Yeah, pretty well established by that time. Yeah, so. Yeah. So he just popularized it. Sounds like he popularized right? Catholic theology. Yeah. Put some meat on it, huh? Mm -hmm. um, where are we at? Uh, the many, many conservative, uh, that one? Yeah. yeah. Many conservative Protestant denominations also believe in an immortal soul that after death ascends either to paradise or descends to hell. Indeed, if the human soul never dies, then it has to go somewhere after the body dies. In short, a false understanding of human nature has led to terrible theological errors from the Bible Study Guide for November 26. Okay, so now we're going to look at a couple of passages that will help us to decide about some of these things. Mark 9, 42 to 48, and compare with Isaiah 66, 24. These are two key passages. Charles? If anyone should cause one of those little ones to lose his faith in me, it would be better for that person to have a large millstone tied around his neck and thrown in the sea. So if your hand makes you lose your faith, cut it off. It is better for you to enter without a hand than to keep both hands and go off to hell, the fire that never goes out. And if your foot makes you lose your faith, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the inner life without a foot than to keep both feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye makes you lose your faith, take it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with only one eye than to keep both eyes and be thrown into hell. There the worms that eat them never die, and the fire that burns will never be put out. American Bible Society. Whoa. Again, this is okay. Jesus said this. Jesus okay. said this. Why did Jesus, Jesus this? say this? <laughs> Isaiah 66, 22 to 24, the last two verses of the Old Testament, just as the new heaven and the new earth will We'll the last two verses of Isaiah, not of, of the Old Testament. Of Isaiah. Yeah. 
the last two verses of Isaiah. That's right. Yeah, it's uh, Malachi. Right, right. Sorry, of Isaiah. That's right. Just as the new heaven and the new earth, and just as the new the new earth and the new heaven will endure by my power, so your descendants, your name will endure. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me in Jerusalem, says the Lord. As they live, they will see the dead bodies, garden, of those who have rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sight of them will be disgusting in the whole human race. Good news, Bible. That's not very good news. This is great good news, isn't it? <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Some interpret the singular noun worm in Mark 9, 48 as an allusion to the supposed disembodied soul or spirit of the wicked that, after death, flies into hell, where it never dies and suffers eternal torment. But this interpretation does not reflect the biblical notion of unconscious death. It also ignores the Old Testament background of this passage, which we just read in Isaiah 66. Actually, quote, the singular, the worm, quote, unquote, is used generically for the worms. It does not mean a single worm. The reference is to worms which feed upon decaying bodies. Okay, so this is not some kind of something feeding on living bodies that make them, them punish them alive and make them pain. This is dead bodies. So what kind of worms or fire are walking about in these passages? Please note that there is no evidence that any souls are escaping and going either to heaven or to hell. No evidence of that in either of these passages. So in the Isaiah passage, are these worms immortal? They live on Do you forever. know about immortal, immortal worms, huh? They must be if they're living on forever. And where will this fire and worms take place? Isaiah seems to suggest that there will be a wonderful reception in heaven for the righteous, but are there immortal worms and fire consuming the wicked within eyesight of the righteous? Clearly, clearly this is an either slash or situation. One is either totally saved or she or he is totally lost. So what are those fires of hell? Well, the Bible study guide says, in his booklet for children entitled Sight of Hell, James Duffy in 1874. James Duffy is the publisher. Oh, okay. Go ahead. This is an English Roman Catholic priest, John Ferris, who wrote it. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, illustrates the eternal torment by means of a great iron, solid iron ball larger than the heavens and the earth. A bird comes once in a mil in a hundred million, hundred millions of years, and just touches the great iron ball with a feather of its wing. Page twenty-four. Furnace. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Argues that the burning of sinners in hell continues even after the iron ball is worn away by such occasional feather touches. Can you imagine? I mean, that's just completely ridiculous. Where, where did they come up with these ideas? He dropped that one up out of his brain, I think. I went to, uh, this is just outside the Vatican City. There is a um, place called <clears throat> the um, Museum of Torture. You folk, yes. you yeah. been there? And how many kinds of devices they had floor after floor after floor to torture and kill people. Yeah. To convert them. They were trying to convert to them. So you, to that this is one of those. That was your evangelism program. <laughs> that, yeah. That's what they So, no, no, this, this gentleman is not too far from that. No. Well, contrast that idea with these verses from the Bible. Malachi 4.1, the Lord Almighty says, the day is coming when all proud and evil people will burn like straw. On that day they will burn up and there will be nothing left of them from the Good News Bible. How long does it take to burn straw? Seconds, really. <laughs> Seconds, that's right. 
You want to go ahead and do Jude 7? Jude 7, also from the Good News Bible. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah and the nearby towns whose people acted as those angels did and indulged in sexual immorality and the perversion and perversion. They suffer the punishment of eternal fire as a plain warning to all. Okay, so you've all been over to visit Sodom and Gomorrah and watch it burn? Mm -hmm. As eternal fire, so it must be gone. <laughs> but doesn't uh, eternal or everlasting mean as long as it shall last? Isn't well, it what, what, what interpretation of Jude 7? We're going to talk about that right now. What is the meaning of the words eternal, everlasting, or forever? Is there a difference? And by the way, for those of you who are interested, I would encourage you to look up uh, Sodom on YouTube and you'll find out that they have been doing some very interesting archaeological investigations of what almost certainly was the original Sodom site, which is quite a distance from where it was traditionally thought to exist. Very interesting area, and they've come up with some very interesting conclusions about how it actually happened. Anyway, going back here, the word eternal, Hebrew olam, or Greek ion, or ionios, carries different meanings depending on the immediate context. For example, when associated with God, everlasting, the word expresses, and that would be Deuteronomy 33, 27, the word expresses his eternity. When related to human beings, Exodus 21, 6, for example, forever, the word is limited by their lifespan. When qualifying fire, Matthew 18, 8, and Matthew 25, 41, everlasting, it implies that the fire will not go out until it fully consumes what is being burned. This means that the eternal fire will be eternal in the sense that it will consume the wicked completely and re irreversibly, leaving them neither root nor branch. And that's, that's an interpretation of our Malachi 4.1 that we just heard. So what about those verses? Deuteronomy 33, 27. God has always been your defense. His eternal arms are your support. He drove out your enemies as you advanced and told you to destroy them all. So eternal arms. Exodus 21, 5 and 6. And if the servant shall plainly say, now here's a story about, and this is the next chapter after giving of the Ten Commandments. So these are other additional rules that were given by Moses immediately following the giving of the Ten Commandments, he came down from the mountain, and it wasn't only the Ten Commandments that he brought down, but he brought a lot of other instructions from God, and this is one of them. If the servant, if you have a servant working for you, shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out from out free. So this was the way it was in those days, the way the, the laws were for slaves. If someone's a slave, and they work for you, and they, you have other, let's say, slaves of the opposite sex, either male or female, and they get interested in that person, they, they request permission to marry, and they marry and they have children, and then you decide you want to go free, you go free without your wife and your children, because they're still your slaves. So that's the understanding here. So this, this person says, no, I'd rather stay, stay with my wife and my kids, and uh, I don't mind working for my master. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges, he shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. And that's what it says, King James Version. Uh, Deuteronomy 15, 16 and 17, Moses said, But your slave may not want to leave, and he may love you and your family and be content to stay. Then take him to the door of your house and leave there, uh, and there pierce his ear, and he will then be your slave for life. Treat your female slaves in the same way. So I jokingly tell my lady friends who have pierced ears that that's a sign of their slavery. <laughs> Matthew 18, 18, and Matthew 25. You want to read that? The, what about the males that have pierced ears? Yeah, same story. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want to read there, Matthew 18, Jim? If your hand or your foot makes you lose your faith, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life without a hand or a foot 
than to keep both hands and both feet and be thrown into eter the eternal fire. Okay, there's the eternal fire, okay? Matthew 25, 41. Then he shall say to those on his left, away from me, you are, excuse me, you that are under God's curse, away to the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Back to Matthew 18, 8 that we had up there. Mm -hmm. I had a client about 30 years ago and uh, did some work for him and he anyway he used to go to the um, uh, up here in and uh, casino the, no the uh, uh, arrowhead hotel oh, oh they, yeah they, who Spring. was it christian crusade or what what was the name campus of that crusade. okay Camp anyway Camp Camp campus crusade for christ uh, there we go okay. right and right and uh so anyway, he read that passage and so he took a um, uh, lawn edger, mm. fired it up, cut his hand off. I didn't make that story up. Wow. Hey. Some people believe... Okay. <laughs> if there's such a thing as everlasting punishment somewhere in the universe, that means that sin and wickedness will never be eliminated. Is it fair for a person, even if she or he has lived a wicked life in this short human existence, to be punished forever. And we need to remember that what we've already learned that only God can produce life. In other words, God would have to keep these people alive indefinitely. Does that mean that he would have to feed them from the tree of life? There's an interesting <laughs> idea. Slip some food for, to them every yeah. now and then. I wonder huh? how many people that, that reason that far along to, yeah. to put in they the, have to eat uh, the food yeah. from the tree of life because their their presupposition is the, the satan's lie you, yeah. you, you, that you're you re really die. a lie yeah. that you really yeah. won't die well uh, but the wicked i mean even the righteous who go to heaven we believe that they will continue to live forever because of what because they, they eat, get, eat from the food, food, food. Yeah. from the tree of life what? Sure. connection with god yeah so where is this eternal fire located? Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The lake of fire and brimstone, mm -hmm. and that surrounds what? The New, the, Jerusalem. Be, the New Jerusalem. It surrounds the New Jerusalem, so you don't dare go outside of the New Jerusalem, Maybe right? It floats on it. Who knows? Years ago, I had a, a guy I was in conversation with, and he tells how he, that he had he died and went to heaven, and he it was showed uh, the, these dead bodies hang out there, or, or tortured, and uh, I mean he, they bring this stuff out. Apparently, there's a new movie out, something similar to that. I don't know who's, really? who conjured these stories up. Uh, but that's that's where we're at. Yeah, the those. church the church had struggled, had struggled with the this idea of eternal punishment until long ago, when the Roman Catholic Church tried to suggest a possible solution. Myra, from the Bible study guide, the Roman Catholic Church holds that the dead, who do not deserve hell, but are not quite ready yet for paradise can have their sins purged in purgatory and then ascend from there to paradise. Their sufferings in purgatory can be reduced by prayers and penances of loved ones. And by paying a lot of money to the church. Yes. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is explicit about purgatory. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Mm. It's the Catechism of the Catholic Church on page 291. It states, too, that their suffering can be alleviated by prayers of their loved ones, as well as other acts on behalf of the dead. The Church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on the behalf of the dead. Yes. On page 291 okay. of the Catechism. These ideas are clearly refuted by the following verses. 
Ecclesiastes 9.10, work hard at whatever you do because there will be no action, no thought, no knowledge, no wisdom in the world of the dead. And that is where you are going. Good News Bible. And Ezekiel 18, 20 to 22, it is the one who sins who will die. A son is not to suffer because of his father's sins, nor a father because of, his, uh, because of the sins of his son. A good person will be rewarded for doing good, and an evil person will suffer for the evil he does. If an evil person stops sinning and keeps my laws, if he does what, a, what is right and good, he will not die, he will certainly live. All his sins will be forgiven and he will live because he did what is right. Good News Bible. So, the dogma of purgatory combines the pagan notion of a burning hell with the pagan practice of praying for the dead. This dogma is unacceptable for those who believe in the biblical teachings, one, that the dead remain resting unconsciously in their graves, Ecclesiastes 9.10, Two, that the righteousness of one fallen human being cannot be transferred to another fallen human being. I mean, we just read that they say, well, if you pay a little money and so forth and so forth and you pray and so forth and so forth, then you're gonna get this other person out of hell. No, it's not, that's not true. We just, Ezekiel 18 just said that's not true. Three, that our only mediator is Jesus Christ. We can't mediate for other sinners. And four, that death is followed by the final judgment without any second chance to repent from the pitfalls of this life. Hebrews 9, 7, that's from our Bible study guide. The idea of hell and of purgatory seriously misrepresented, misrepresent the character of God. They are anti-biblical theories. From the writings of Ellen White, Satan's work since his fall is to misinterpret our Heavenly Father. He suggested the dogma of the immortality of the soul, Thou shalt not surely die, was spoken by the great deceiver unto Adam and Eve and Eden, and we are acquainted with the result of believing his words. The idea of an eternally burning hell was the production of Satan. Purgatory is his invention. These teachings falsify the character of God that he should be regarded as severe, revengeful, arbitrary, and not exercising forgiveness. Without the correct knowledge of God, the human family would be the best of all divine strength. With false attributes kept before the mind is belonging to God, the human family would be the dupes of satanic lies and the subjects of satanic agencies, and he could practice upon their incredulity with success. The plans of Satan have been indeed in a large degree successful, as the lack of a knowledge of God in the Christian world can testify. So what's the solution? A knowledge of God. Satan's cruel deceptions have had their effect and have demonstrated his attributes as a deceiver, a liar, a murderer, an accuser of God, and of all who love God. That's in Manuscript 51, 1890 from Mellon White. Does it really matter what we believe or is it only important in whom we believe? Jim? Ellen White. We are not to think of God only as a judge and to forget him as our loving father. Nothing can do our souls greater harm than this, for our whole spiritual life will be molded by our conception, conceptions of God's character. Ellen White. Wow. And is there, are there any other religious persuasions, Christian, let's put it, that have uh, emphasis on God's character? Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't. I, it's part of our teaching about the great controversy. All right. Yeah. I don't think anybody else addressed it. It's almost when you try to talk to them, it's like you're talking past them. They're in a yeah. different ball ballpark. It is true that many Protestant groups have re rejected the idea of purgatory, but they still believe in the immortal soul as some sort of disembodied spirit which lives in the presence of God. So what is the truth about God's plan for the dead? Revelation 20, 12 through 14. And I saw the dead, great, and small alike, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and another book was opened, the book of the living. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its death, dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. 
then death and the world of the dead were thrown into the lake of fire this lake fire is the second death good news bible the bible clearly teaches that there are only a few human beings currently in heaven those who have been translated such as enoch genesis 5:24 and elijah 2 kings 2:9 to 11 or resurrected from the dead, such as Moses in Jude 9, and those raised with Christ, Matthew 27, 51 to 53. So we know, we don't know how many rose with Christ, but we're not, we're talking about, you know, maybe 50 or 100 max, I would say. I mean, that's just a guess, but um, some people in heaven. So, Myra? Yeah, Revelation 6, 9 to 11. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. And then there's those passages, Exodus 29, 12, and Leviticus 4, 7, and, 50, and 8, 15, talk about the soul, talk about the blood being poured under the altar. Go ahead. Okay, do you want me to read all of that? No, no. Okay. The souls. Um, under the altar, the souls of them. I'm, I've lost it. Under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. In verse 10. Okay. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge their, our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled that was so another catholic reference to this passage says spirits and souls of the righteous now this is a catholic reference the spirits and souls of the righteous there is no hint in the context that this phrase refers to anything other than living people Compare Psalm 103, 1 and 2. All faithful people in the Good News translation, which we refer to often, may be less forceful, but it avoids the idea that departed souls are in view here. Very interesting passage from a Catholic uh, commentary on the deuterocanonical uh, books. What are the deuterocanonical books? The apocryphal. We the apocryphal them. books. Compare this passage from the apocrypha. Second Ezra 4:35. Did not the souls of the righteous in their chambers ask about these matters, saying, How long are we to remain here? And when will the harvest of our reward come? That's from the Catholic edition of the New Revised Standard Version. Of course, that's a, one of the apocryphal books. Yeah. So the idea of purgatory and the idea of hell um, come up, come somewhat from passages they have taken from the Apocrypha. Heaven is supposed to be a place of rest, peace, and joy. Does it sound like the souls under the altar are having a great time? No. Well, clearly Roman Catholic doctrine is based on a couple of passages from the Apocrypha. And writing to the Corinthians, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 18, that if there is no resurrection of the dead, quote, those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And remember his argument there about if, if nobody is raised from the dead, then Christ is not raised from the dead. If he's not raised from the dead, then those who've died are perished. Just, just as simple as that. If those people are already in heaven enjoying the bliss of heaven, how can we say they're perished if there's no resurrection? The New Testament doctrine of the resurrection of the righteous is in complete opposition to the idea of an immortal soul. We need to remember that the dead are having the longest, deepest sleep that they have ever experienced. God will arouse them from their sleep either at the second coming for the righteous or at the third coming for the wicked. So how many are going to be resurrected? All. Everybody. All of them. Everybody. Okay. Jim, I think that's John yours. 5, 28 and 29. Do not be surprised at this. The time is coming when all the dead will hear his voice and come out of their graves. Those who have done good will rise and live, and those who have done evil will, all, will rise and be condemned. 
Now we believe those two resurrections are a thousand years apart, but there are, they are separate resurrections. Will the wicked really be alive forever, suffering in hell? What does 1 John 5, 3 to 12 say God, John suggested about who will receive eternal life? What does it tell us about who's going to receive eternal life? For our love, God means that we obey His commandments, and His commandments are not too hard for us because every child of God is able to defend the world, world defeat the world, defeat the world, and we win the victory over the world by means of our faith. Who can defend the defeat? defeat the world, only the person who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the one who came to this earth of his baptism and the uh, blood of his death. He came not only with the water, uh, but with both water and the blood. And the Spirit himself testifies that this is true because the uh, Spirit is truth. There are three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three gave the same testimony. The testimony is this, God has given us eternal life, and this life has the source in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Good News Bible. That's from our Good News Bible. There's an interesting side note that we need to look at. 1 John 5, 7 and 8, in the King James Version says something quite different. I want to read there that. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. You should notice that these words from the King James Version are, do not appear in the Good News Bible or in any other of the more up-to-date versions. Why is that? Because they were written by a Roman Catholic priest early in the church's history and imported into the King James Version at the insistence of a Roman Catholic cleric in 1611. And You aren't saying that our Bible is corrupted, are you? In this case, it was corrupted. The King James Version was corrupted because someone had promised that they would do this if someone could find this particular passage. It was in the, it was in the Latin Bible, but he couldn't find any Greek Bibles. So he says, no, I'm not, uh, we're, we're translating the Greek, I have to see. So the guy, met, this Roman Catholic priest manufactured a Greek, he translated from the Latin back to Greek and said, here's the one, that, there it is right there. And so the guy said, well, okay. That was Erasmus end up in his third edition of the yeah. Greek New Testament. Yeah, this, the first two editions it didn't have that, and none but of those, made that commitment. And yeah, so and he it, kind of texts like this make it uh, pretty tough to reason with our Muslim friends. There you go. So the scriptures are corrupted. Yep. But the thing is, we know what the corruptions are. Yeah. And this is one of those. Just to make things completely clear, let us remember that only the God had, have inherited immortality. 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. His appearing will be brought about at the right time by God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He alone is immortal. He lives in the light that no one can approach, no one has ever seen him, no one can, can ever see him. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let us remember that Adam and Eve had access to the tree of life. And they had to eat of that tree every, every day to, to remain alive, right? And thus should have lived forever. We should all be living in the Garden of Eden. But when Adam and Eve chose to sin, they were expelled from the garden and thus none of the human family have since been able to access the tree of life. Romans 5, 12 through 21 explains that while sin came in because of the act of one man, Adam, we can inherit eternal life because of another human, in, this case, in that case, a divine human, Jesus Christ, who makes it possible for us to return to that original condition. John 6, 40 and John 11, 25 make it clear that only those who believe in the Son will have eternal life. 
even though they may die that first death, they will live. Eternal life is a gift from God to his faithful followers. Tim, I think that's yours. Ellen White had said, had man after his fall been allowed free access to the tree of life, he would have lived forever and thus sin would have been immortalized. Okay, so there's Ellen White agreeing that if God would keep feeding fruit from the tree of life to the to the wicked, they could be immortal sinners, right? Go ahead. But cherubim and a flaming sword kept the way of the tree of life, kept the way of the tree of life, Genesis 3.24, and not one of the family of Adam has been permitted to pass that barrier and partake of the life-giving fruit. Therefore, there is not an immortal sinner. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 533-534. Okay, so here's a question for you. Did Adam and Eve ever try to describe to their children what the fruit from the tree of life tasted like? We have no record. <laughs> At least I've never heard of yeah. it. Yeah. How, how repugnant to every motion of love and mercy and even to our sense of justice is the doctrine that the wicked dead are tormented with fire and brimstone in an eternal burning hell, that for the sins of a brief earthly life they are to suffer torture as long as God shall live. Yet this doctrine has been widely taught and is still embodied in many of the creeds of Christendom said a learned doctor of divinity quotes the sight of heaven excuse no. me that the sight of hell torments will exalt the happiness of the saints forever it would, it would make you happier to see somebody else suffering for their sins shouldn't it wow it's a when they sense when they see others who are of the same nature and born under the same circumstances plunged into such misery and they are so distinguished it will make them sensible of how happy they are. Another wow. used these words, while the decree of reprobation is eternally executing on the vessels of wrath, the smoke of their torment will be eternally ascending in view of the vessels of mercy, who, instead of taking the part of these miserable objects, will say, Amen, Alleluia, praise be the Lord. Those wow. who present the views expressed in the quotations above may be may be learned and even honest men, but they are deluded by the sophistry of Satan. He leads them to misconstrue strong expressions of scripture given to the language, excuse me, given to the language and the coloring of bitterness and malignity, which pertains to himself, not to the, our creator. As, li excuse me, as I live, said the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live eternal, excuse me, turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die? Ezekiel 33, 11. It is beyond the power of human mind to estimate the evil which has been wrought by the heresy of eternal torment. The religion of the Bible, full of love and goodness, and abounding in compassion is darkened by superstition and clothed with terror. When we consider in what false colors Satan has painted the character of God, can we wonder that our merciful creator is feared, dreaded, and even hated? The appalling view of God, which has spread over the whole over the world from the teaching of the pulpit, have made many thousands, yes, millions, of skeptics and infidels. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 535. Okay, Charles, maybe you can pick it up there. I make one co yeah. comment about that. Yeah. What, that, that paradigm, uh, cause some years ago I made a, or a, a, an acronym. Everybody's got a pope. Mm -hmm. A paradigm of preconceived errors. Mm -hmm. And then what people do, they read that, they do eisegesis with the text. They read into something based upon their presuppositions. So everybody's got a pope. <laughs> <laughs> this is Ellen White. A life of rebellion against God has unleaf, unfitted, unfitted them for heaven. Its purity, holiness, and peace would be torture 
to them. Now let's think about that for a moment. How could purity, holiness, and peace be torture to someone? Well, if they were rebellious against God to begin with, and if all How the could they be at peace without it being if all all the things you wanted to do were things which were forbidden to heaven yeah. in heaven right. it would be a torture yeah and the Lord does not want that to happen um, they would long to free from that holy place they would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them okay let's hold on that for a second the people surrounding the New Jerusalem when it comes down at the third coming and Jesus is revealed and the wicked are outside the city. Is this talking about them? They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them. What did they get? Did Revelation, was it 16? Or where it says that they call for the rocks? Six, oh, Revelation 6, yeah. Um, but Philippians chapter 2 also is somewhere mm -hmm. here. Yeah. See, where everyone will kneel and say, yeah, yeah. Have, he is really right. Yeah. Yep. So, Go ahead. The, the destiny of the wicked is fixed by their own choice. Uh -huh. Their exclusion from heaven is uh, voluntarily with themselves and just as merciful on the part of God. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 542. That's an incredible chapter. Yes. We would encourage you, if you have an opportunity, to take a few minutes and read the whole chapter. So why do those who believe in the immortal soul cling to that belief so tenaciously? We might understand why they want to believe that their loved ones are, quote, with the Lord, end quote, However, would they really want to be able to see from heaven the sight of all the wicked who are being punished? The idea is... Like in the parable that Jesus told of yeah. the rich man and Lazarus. The ideas of hell and even purgatory present God in a very terrible light. God is seen as a monster and a tyrant. Let us review the different views of punishment and death held by various Christian groups. Okay, now you can give me all your scoop here on these different ideas. Well, there are three views regarding the eternal hell, fire of hell, compete, complete. Compete. These three different views compute, oh, compete in compete Christianity. Compete in Christianity. Number one, the traditionalist view, hell fire that torments forever and without ceasing. Hell exists as a real place somewhere in the underworld where real fire torments immortal souls forever. According to this view, the conscious suffering of the wicked comes right after death and lasts throughout eternity. I can't imagine. That's that. exciting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, okay, eternal, Jordan. eternal burning hell, that's what most, yeah, of, the, yes. most of the world believes in, but, most of Christianity. Well, that's, wh that's yeah. why they... Uh, they're, you, why they got to get out. Well, they peddle instant wealth and instant health and fire insurance. Yeah. And Jesus died to pay the penalty, so you don't have to think. You're once saved, always saved. I mean, you, you, the, you don't have to wrestle with the questions that we just, do. Just, just give enough money to the church. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, well, I, just to, to follow a God that would burn someone they, forever. For, it's just, it's like they, they wear an amulet around their neck. Mm -hmm. uh, just a little good luck charm called a cross with some people. I mean, it, it, the, the depth of... Mm. Yeah. Okay, but it's also, two. Oh, go ahead. But it's also in Hinduism yeah. and Islam. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. yeah. Very little new. What was the psalmist says? Nothing new under the sun? Yeah. Okay, number two. The conditionalist or the anti... Annihilationist. Uh, annihilationist view. The lake of fire irreversibly and totally consumes the wicked, evil angels, and the devil in the Last Judgment. So Human where do we read about that lake of fire? Revelation. The Revelation yeah. 20, 21. Yes, Revelation 20. Okay. Human, human beings are not inherently immortal, and they do not possess immortal souls. As sinners, they are doomed to eternal death unless they accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Immortality is a con 
is conditioned on receiving God's grace and exercising faith in Jesus. John 3.16, John 5.24, Romans 3, and on. Um, Hell is not a place where wicked souls and spirits go immediately after death, but it's understood as a lake of fire, in quotes, in which the wicked will be totally consumed at the end of human history. Malachi 4.1 and several more texts there. This fire prepared for the devil and the fallen angels will annihilate them together with the wicked at last or executive judgment at the last or executive yeah, judgment. Yeah, the, the okay. final exercise of God's justice is the yeah. executive judgment. Yeah. Okay. Okay, number three, the restore, restorationist. Restorationist and the universal, universal, universalist mm -hmm. view. Hellfire immediately purifies ultimately. and saves, ultimately purifies and saves everyone. Universalists, make me say those words, claim that all people will ultimately be saved, including the wicked, evil angels, and Satan, because of hellfire will purify them. This understanding is built on the recognition that after death, the immortal soul of the wicked cannot go immediately to heaven, but will suffer in the fire of God's judgment. Okay, does that sound like a good plan? Is it a good idea to live a good life here and just go straight to heaven, or wait until you go through perhaps million, millions of years or a long period of time in the fires of hell to purify your evil? What does, that, what does that mean to go through the fires of hell and be purified? What, I mean, it's describe... Purging. It's called a purging to get rid of the... But uh, what actually is happening there? I mean, they, they are they dead? Or are they supposed to they make stuff asleep? up? Asleep? They're, they, they're, they're sorry for the mistakes they made. Yeah, but the okay. analogy is, is purification of, of metals that are purified by the fire. Right. The drugs. Well, I, that part I understand. I'm just wondering what they're doing. It doesn't. To, Okay. okay. <laughs> Continuing on. This let, fire... Let, let's just say that uh, we don't believe in this thing. Uh, yes. This fire will gradually cleanse them, okay? And then in some future time, the, the precise moment will depend on the individual's response to the purification process. Everyone will finally be saved. For an evaluation of these three different views, see... And there's a whole article about that in the Andrews University Seminary Studies. I had not heard the universal, I, you know, I know the yes, universal thing. I No, I, I've heard about the universals. I don't mean that. It's, I view it as they want everybody to be saved. Right. Yeah. But to go through this purging for who knows how long and what that means makes no sense. Well, they, they can do that in those burning fires, whatever, and then you can hang on to some saint that has had uh, more good, they have a scale, they, and you're, uh, balance the scale out and somebody has more goods and you don't have good deeds, and so you can balance those out. It, that's in, in Christian, uh, it can, even in somewhat in Judaism. But uh, this idea of purgatory, Islam has a purgatory, uh, Hindus have a purgatory, and and. Christians have a purgatory of well, who sorts. came first. I've heard some universalists say, "I don't want to believe in a God that wouldn't save everybody." That but there, there again, the problem is, what does "save" mean? If we if we'd use a better word, a more descriptive word, would be "healed." Yes. Okay. If 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 somebody God is uh, wholesale saves people, what does that really mean? Nobody wrestles with the question. Well, that's what we've got now. I mean, how would it be different than what we have now? If all the people are allowed to go on doing what they're doing, and then God saves them, do we, how's, how's anything proved? Do we equate uh, saved with eternal life? Well, and, they would. And eternal life is defined as knowing Jesus God. Christ, John, John 17. Yeah, John 17, 3 and 4. Uh, uh, but they don't, most people, religions, don't address those things. We have suggested that the idea of immortal worms is repugnant. 
but there are also other problematic expressions we need to look at. Number one, from, this is from the Bible study guide. Number one, worms or maggots will not die. Isaiah 66, 24. How are we to understand the biblical statement? The worms, and the Hebrew word is given, that eat them, that is the wicked dead, will not die. In the context of Isaiah 65 and 66, the wicked are those who do not serve the Lord and who rebelled against him and who finally are slain by the Lord, Isaiah 66, 16. First, the, the description is physical. These wicked are seen and they have physical bodies. The maggots do not prey on the souls or Im immaterial spirits of the deceased. Okay, can you imagine a maggot working on an immaterial spirit? Okay. Very difficult. Yeah. The worms do not receive the gift of eternal life. No divine miracle is performed on them. Third, this picture of maggots that eat the dead bodies of the wicked is a metaphor of the same sort as a picture of the fire that will not be quenched. That now is let's, Gehenna. Okay, yeah, it's Gehenna. So let's talk about that just very briefly. Outside the city of Jerusalem, outside of one of the gates of ancient Jerusalem, there was a place where everybody dumped their garbage. In order to get rid of that garbage, in order to somehow or other keep it from just building up, and they tried to keep a fire burning there. And uh, the maggots, of course, were there, the fire was there, and the idea was to try to get rid of the junk. Okay? A point, or the second uh, of these expressions, quote, their fire shall not be quenched, end quote, from Isaiah 66, 24, quote, and they shall go out and look on the dead bodies of the men who have rebelled against me, for their worm shall not die, they, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence to all flesh. To quench a fire is to put it out, to prevent it from burning up, or to stop it before it accomplishes its task. Thus, by extension, a fire that, quote, shall not be quenched, end quote, means that the fire has not been extinguished because there is no power to stop it from achieving what fire naturally achieves, that is, the total destruction. The fire cannot be resisted or refused. Thus, the meaning of the imaginary is transparent. These dead persons have no chance to be alive again. The judgment on these wicked is final, and it means that God's judgment of destruction will not be stopped until a complete consummation has been accomplished. Okay, so in other words, Malachi 4 says what? They will be like burned straw. Yeah. How much is left there? Almost nothing. And it happens very quickly. Yes. Not for, not burning forever. There is, continuing from the, from the Bible study guide, there is no escape from this ultimate death. No one can rescue the wicked from the horrible end. No reversal is possible. Judgment is ultimate and destruction is complete. It will not be interrupted until the bodies perish. Thus, the final destiny of the wicked is irrevocable and permanent. Barry Webb concludes on Isaiah 66, 24, quote, As it stands, it seems to depict annihilation rather than eternal torment. The bodies are dead, close quote. And the reference is given as quoted in the Bible study guide. Yes, and, but it's quoted from a non-Adventist author. So there are, what we're, what we're really trying to point out is there are Bible scholars who apparently have studied these things and have come up with, uh, based this on scripture, the views that we, we espouse that we believe are correct. They're not very popular. No. But the other one was from, from Grand Rapids mm -hmm. earlier, which is... Uh, yeah. So how does all this fit with our teaching from the third angel's message? Now, we have some real good news here, right? Revelation 14, 10 and 11, will themselves, these people, these people who refuse to accept God's plan for them, will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them, 
goes up forever and ever. Now, by the way, let's just stop for a second. What is smoke? What does it consist of? Burnt. Ash. Burnt particles. Well, the, 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 there's nothing live in it. No. None. It's the dead remains of what used to be presumably live. So the smoke ascends up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in its image for anyone, anyone who has the mark of its name. And Revelation 20, verse 10, Then the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had already been thrown, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So, pretty clear, right? Our Bible study guide says, This text fits well into the conditional immortality interpretation. This view holds that God will finally and fully bring his enemies to judgment with absolute destruction and extinction as the result. And that's from Evangelical Quarterly. Suggesting God's fire represented in the third angel's message is eternal means that it is unquenchable and further suggests that there is no point of return. There is no second chance. Annihilation is total and complete. We should also remember that various, the various understandings of the words eternal, forever, and everlasting. We already looked at those. Those words mean for God, it's everlasting. For human beings, it's as long as you can live. But for fire, it's a, until it goes out, right? The Bible clearly speaks about a lake of fire. And that lake of fire is located where? Around the holy city. It surrounds the holy city. Are we going to be surrounded by it? Is that just another word for the hell? For hell? How long does the lake of fire last? And by the way, what does the lake of fire consist of? And who lives in it? And who who lives in it? Yeah. Thirty-three, fourteen. The righteous. <laughs> well, they don't live in the lake of well. well in, the, in the eternal uh, burnings. Who yeah. lives in the eternal burnings? Yeah, so exactly. How can each one of us make absolutely certain that we do not end up in that lake of fire? In other words, how can we be inside the city instead of outside the city? Because clearly if you accept Revelation, especially 19 and 20, <clears throat> very clear that the righteous will be inside the city and the wicked will be outside the city and the fire is only outside the city. So hmm. which, where do we want to be? We want to be inside or we want to be outside? That's the question. And I'm going to leave that question with you out there to think about. You want to be inside the city or do you want to be outside the city with all these things we've been talking about? Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is for us to have the correct biblical version of things that doesn't cause us to think you're a tyrant or uh, some kind of an awful person who would keep people tormented forever in hell. We're thankful that that hell that um, doesn't exist as it so many people believe. Help us to have the courage and the correct understanding to spread to those who we have the opportunity to do so the truth about uh, these things is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.